Well, I think we'll get started and people will join us um, in the next few minutes, hopefully. hopefully. So my name is Jodie and I'm the Family Support and Gender Equity Officer at Nillambique Shire Council. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where I'm located, the Rundry Willem clan and the traditional owners of the lands where you are all tonight. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge that today is International Day of People with Disability and the importance of us all to challenge stereotypes and the way we think about disability and really see the ability in disability, which is this year's theme. Millenbeek Council in partnership with Banyul City Council, City of Whittlesea, Darabin City Council, Yarra Plenty Regional Library, Respect Victoria and the Municipal Association of Victoria are very pleased to host tonight's session, Some Girls, Some Boys, All Kids, Exploring Gender in the Early Years with Nellie Thomas. Nellie Thomas is an Australian comedian and author who is passionate about social justice, neurodiversity, gender, family violence, equity, and the early years. Nellie regularly appears on radio, television podcasts and started her own podcast in 2020 called Person, Place and Thing. I actually listened to her latest episode where she interviews her eight-year-old daughter and it made me smile, laugh and think, which is what Nellie does really well. So Nellie is the author of four books, including the children's books, Some Girls, Some Boys and Some Brains, a book celebrating neurodiversity. So as this is a virtual event, we all have a responsibility to make this session safe and inclusive where we can all learn and engage, free from harassment and discrimination. We ask that you are considerate of others and respect the diversity of ideas and experiences. We will remove disrespectful or inappropriate comments and you will be removed from the forum. This forum is focused on gender equality. We know that sometimes these conversations can bring up issues about family violence and violence against women. If you need support or advice about family violence, please contact 1800 RESPECT, which is 1800 737 732. This event will be recorded and only the presenters on the screens will be visible and can be heard. We encourage you to put questions in the chat function below and Liz from City of Whittlesea would moderate the Q&A at the end of Nellie's presentation. Nellie is very happy to answer all of your questions. So now without further delay, please welcome Nellie. Ah, oh, thank you, Jodie. Uh, I appreciate your lovely introduction and oh, thank you everyone for joining. Like I know that there, like a lot of us are zoomed out <laughs> and I appreciate that you have embraced uh, the Zoom and that you're here on a Thursday night. There's a multitude of other things that you could be doing. Um, I should forewarn you, I'm sure there's a number of parents, and I know there's some kinder teachers and some other people who um, have joined us. I, I can't actually see you, but I know this from the list. Um, I may have various children, dogs, you know, even a partner, you know, who knows? There could be various things that happen tonight, but we'll go with the flow as is the theme of 2020. Now I'm gonna share my screen um, and hopefully this will, work and I'm going to get a no that didn't work you slideshow there we go and let me go back there and Liz can you give me a thumbs up if that's working thank you excellent um, so I've been asked by Jody and Liz and the team uh, to talk to you I guess mostly as uh, an early years author on promoting gender equity in the early years. I have a special interest um, in this area and I know all of you do as well. I assume that's why you are here. The format for today, I'm going to introduce myself um, and my family, talk about gender and kids stories. I really am keen to talk about practical strategies for promoting the early years because I have been sort of rocking around this area for a number of years. And one thing that slightly frustrates me sometimes is we hear about what we need to do, but sometimes no one tells us what to actually do. So I'm gonna try and pro provide some practical um, tips, talk a little bit about my book since this whole area is why I wrote them. And then as Jodie said, do some questions and answer at the end. And I'm more than happy to take whatever questions that you've got. 
Um, as Jody said, I'm really pleased that Nillenbeck Council, uh, Banyol Whittlesea, Darabin Councils and Yarra Plenty uh, Regional Library have put this event on. Thank you. I know Mav has also been involved and I think Respect Victoria as well. So thank you all. Uh, events like this don't happen without sponsorship, so I appreciate it. This event is part of the uh, 16 days uh, of activism against gender-based violence, which happens every year. Um, the theme for this year is Call It Out. And I think this year, more than any other year, um, we've been talking a lot about pandemics. Uh, gender-based violence is absolutely a pandemic. Uh, and unfortunately, it, it has also increased significantly during lockdowns and um, in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic. But I think it's an interesting way that we need to start reframing um, gendered violence, basically. Now, look, it's a heavy subject. Like, there's no getting around that. As Jody said, it's it can be um, a very sometimes divisive subject. It can be a difficult subject to talk about. Um, also, we're doing it on Zoom. Okay, so there may be technical problems. That's just how we roll in 2020. If something happens, like if you drop out of the Zoom, for example, all I can suggest, I can't promote that you have a sip of a G and T, although that would probably be my strategy, or a piece of chocolate. Um, take a deep breath, just rejoin. Whatever happens, uh, it'll be okay. Now, first things first, you probably, I think on the flyer, you saw, this is a publicity photo of mine from a couple of years ago. Geez, I looked good. Um, but let's address the elephant in the room. About probably three weeks into the lockdown, I reckon I was looking like this. So I'm sure some of you let yourselves go, as we say. I decided to cut all my hair off. Um, basically, I couldn't be bothered dyeing it blonde myself in lockdown. And I let the kids do my makeup, which, um, you know, just like to present some reality and not that sort of Insta version of life. Oh, sourdough. My goodness me. Um, geez, I got over sourdough. Like I did try, you know, when everyone was telling us we should be baking sourdough whilst homeschooling and, you know, trying to work from home and doing all the things we've been doing in 2020. This was my best effort. As you can see, it didn't exactly work out well, but it was fine because I realised that you could buy sourdough at the shops. So my new motto for 2020, and perhaps I'll take this forward, um, aim lower, you know, stop, stop trying to do everything. That is, I was going to say it's a gendered um, motto. It probably is, to be perfectly honest, but we'll get onto that later. One of the other things I found interesting as a health ambassador, um, I've been a health ambassador for a number of years. I, I got so many health promotion messages coming through my email, my social media and various other places telling us how we should cope, you know, like we should be just like playing board games with the kids and, you know, start the zero to 5K and I don't know, cook meals every night with the kids and teach them if they're going to be homeschooling, maybe they could cook lunch. Someone suggested to me I could write a novel. Uh, even had someone else say, maybe you could learn Auslan, you know, as though we had some free time during 2020. How we actually cope, and I'm not recommending this, any of these as a strategy. I'm just telling you the truth because that's how I roll. Um, we overate. I can't be the only one. Uh, I've, some days I would cook a cake just so I could eat the icing, you know. Please don't look at me with your judgy, judgy eyes. Um, if you are doing that, I can't see them, so it's all good. Some of us might have drunk more than we normally did. Again, not recommending it, just saying it's a fact. Um, bit of online shopping. I became very familiar with the postman, very, very familiar. Looked forward to his daily visit. That's a sports bra that I bought. It said it was an XL. Um, I don't know what XL it was fitting, maybe a Barbie doll, but um, it certainly wasn't fitting on me. And at one point, I think this was probably the low point. Um, any of you homeschooling parents will, I think, relate to this. I did hide in the garden shed from the kids for a little bit. I just <laughs> needed to get out of there and just please leave me alone. The toilet was occupied because we were all working from home. Now, I've got two kids, um, two little girls, as you can probably see, they are very different um, girls, both equally adorable. Uh, the first girl, since we're talking about stereotypes, she very much fits the girl stereotype, certainly did when she was younger in this age. 
you know, she loves pink stuff. She wants to do her nails all the time. She's like into Harry Styles. That was day wear, you know, just rocking around in a tutu. Like that's her thing. She's adorable. She's gorgeous. Um, girl number two, very different. All right. She was invited to a princess party. She went as Darth Vader, right? Walked in the, the whole thing, which um, the kids were really into. The parents freaked out. I'll return to that. It's quite an interesting thing. Uh, invited to a mermaid party, went as Captain America. During lockdown, she wrote her first novel, which I was very proud of. Uh, it's called The Buttocks of the Human Butt. Uh, so that's the kind of stuff she's into, right? Farts, bums, um, trucks, anything dirty, anything involving dirt, destruction, you know, she just is into all of that stuff. So equally wonderful girls, very different kind of girls. You can probably see where I'm going with this. Um, now, they are both Generation V. I am Generation X. I'm sure we've got some baby boomers. We'll have some other generations too. I had to research Gen V. I tell you the stuff they can do. They can slay the Ender Dragon. If any of you have got kids of that age, you'll know what I'm talking about. They can name all the Norris nuts. Um, that's not a food stuff. It's a family. They can disable the parental controls on YouTube. Anyone who tells you they can't is uh, delusional. They can express their feelings, which is lovely. When I was little in the 70s and 80s, we didn't have feelings. Um, so I've had to learn to, to deal with that. They can quote the Geneva Convention. But I tell you, stuff they can't do. I don't know if any of the kinder teachers can testify to this, but they seem to have a lot of memory problems. You know, when my kids come home from school and I'm like, what did you do in maths today? Can't remember. Who did you play with at lunchtime? Can't remember. Did you do anything interesting? Can't remember. Hmm. What's my iTunes password? Oh, Nelly250 pinky underscore backslash dollar sign. Oh, that you can remember. Interesting. But look, bless them. They just about drove me around the bend during lockdown. But then one day I got up and this was on the fridge. Oh, my mum's the best mum in the world. And that's a fact. That's not fake news. You don't have to check it. I am, in fact, the best mum in the world. Now, why am I passionate about preventing violence against women? Well, why wouldn't you be for a start? Um, but I do have a personal connection to the issue. This is my beautiful love of my life. My grandma, my nana, Nana Gladys had 12 children, absolutely adored her. Um, she was subjected to some horrific family violence. My other grandma on my dad's side um, was also subjected to family violence. And, and let's get real, we all know at the time that they would have been my age and younger, no one would have cared. Not only would no one have cared, it was completely normal. Um, there were no services available. Um, to the point where, and I don't want to dwell on this because I know that it's very sad, but my, my grandmother, the reason there's a question mark in the middle, I don't have a single photo of her. She died in her 40s. Indeed, I'm in my 40s. She died around my age. She wasn't... Um, a statistic of family violence. She wasn't literally killed, um, but she absolutely died prematurely as a result of family violence. So I have a personal connection to it. I'm very passionate about the area. I'm going to make three assumptions tonight. Okay. There's, it's a massive area. I obviously can't cover everything. The main assumption I'm going to make is that you want the best for your kids and that you want the best for my kids that you all understand you wouldn't have come to this if you didn't think we're all connected, that you believe that rigid gender stereotypes are harmful. Now, I don't mean that, you know, my oldest daughter should have been told not to wear a to-do or not to like pink. I mean that it shouldn't be prescriptive, that it shouldn't be you have to be this way in order to be a girl or to be a boy. I'm also going to assume that you want to challenge those stereotypes and that's why you've turned up to an event like this. Now, a major assumption I'm going to make, which I would have thought one could make this assumption, but I've been doing these events for nearly 20 years. And I know you can't make this assumption, but I am going to assume tonight that you all accept the research. Okay, there's a lot of opinion in this area, but the research is very clear. Violence against women is the biggest contributor to ill health and premature death in women aged 15 to 44 in Victoria. Now, that we've known that for I think about 15 or 16 years based on the research from Vic Health, but it's worth remembering. You know, you think how much we hear about obesity, smoking, car accidents, a whole range of health issues 
the biggest contributor to ill health and premature death for women in Victoria is family violence or intimate partner violence. Now, the drivers of violence. Now, some people don't like the word drivers. Um, causes is controversial. But basically, how does this violence happen? Why does this violence happen? Again, we know this from some very smart people at Big Health. Um, who are not a crazy fringe group. This is the Victorian Health Promotion Agency. They are very well respected, world respected. What is behind this epidemic level of violence? Well, one is condoning violence against women. Um, another issue is men's control of decision-making. In other words, men sort of being in charge in public and it assumed being that men are leaders rigid gender uh, roles and stereotypes around what it is to be a man and a woman, a masculine and feminine, and male peer relations that emphasize aggression. So male relationships that rely on putting women down or making fun of women or talking in disrespectful ways. So my main aim is to challenge rigid gender roles um, for, for three reasons. One is because like it's just fair. You know, I mean, the research, I totally believe the research. Research is really important. It's very important for lobbying and so on. But just on a basic human level, sometimes I think to myself, do we really even need the research? It's just fair to let kids be who they are, to let people be who they are. Why do I care if someone doesn't fit into a preconceived gender box? Another reason, as I've outlined, is because I know from the research that challenging gender stereotypes does contribute to reducing violence against women. And again, that research is very clear. This is not them having a guess. In communities where rigid gender roles are less, there is less violence against women and girls. The other thing that I think we're starting to hear a little bit more about now, and people in the sector have been talking about for a longer time, but we're hearing more about in the mainstream, one way to frame another epidemic, which is, a, is an epidemic of suicide, among men in Australia is to talk about that as a form of violence by men against themselves. And it's really clear that if we want to tackle men's mental health, we need to be allowing them to have feelings. We need to be allowing boys to learn how to have feelings, to identify their feelings, to be vulnerable, for it not to be seen as weak, to have an internal life, um, to be able to reach out for help, all the things that we know help with mental health. But I feel like we sort of, boys start showing signs of sort of self-harm or poor mental health, say in teenage years and in their 20s and 30s, and they act out against themselves and others. And we turn around and kind of go, talk about your feelings when we've spent, you know, zero to 10 saying man up and be tough and, you know, don't cry and all that kind of, it's, it's such a contradiction that we'll get into more. Um, what are gender stereotypes? I won't dwell on this too much because I reckon you already know, but the way I think of it is that, you know, girls are supposed to be small, um, not just literally, but in terms of personality and their presence in the world, caring, you know, often it's framed in positive ways, like you're so beautiful, you're so caring, you're lovely and emotional, you're a good girl, that kind of stuff. Um, whereas men and boys are brave and strong and wild and at its most extreme, violent, um, hard, messy. And, you know, those stereotypes are reinforced over and over again, literally hundreds to thousands of times a day. Um, just casual things, you know, we will all still hear this. Goodness knows some of us will hear it at Christmas lunch when we get together with uh, people we don't normally hang out with. Boys will be boys. When do we hear that? Usually when they're doing something violent. Um, boys don't cry, you know, of course boys cry. And we need to be giving more permission um, to boys to cry. Act like a man or man up. You know, even in 2020, we still keep hearing those kinds of things. And I think the everydayness of these kinds of messages can mask them. You know, when you're so in, in a culture, you don't even see how constructed it is all the time. Just as one example, I literally did this today. At about 4.30, I just Googled boys' toys. We're coming up to Christmas. I could give you a thousand examples of how we still indoctrinate kids into gender roles, but I thought it's nearly Christmas. Let's just put boys' toys. What are they? They're active. They're construction. They are trucks. They are cars. They are, you know, I'm not saying boxing's necessarily bad, but it's aggressive. Um, they're active. You know, they're very stereotypically boy. This is in 2020. This isn't, you know, 
a hundred years ago. I Google girls toys. What do we get there? Uh, makeup, pink squishy dolls, looking after babies, doing hair, um, worrying about appearance, consumerism. And again, I just remind us that's just one Google search on one day, like an hour and a half ago, two hours ago, let alone if we start to do a deep dive into culture. Of course, we see this in adult culture too. And one of the discussions I think we forget in this um, space is that kids see adult culture too, you know, whether directly or indirectly. Now this, again, you may judge me for this, but I love myself a bit of shit TV. Forgive the language. That's as far as I'll go. I love myself a bit of Survivor, right? So in lockdown, I've been watching New Zealand Survivor and so interesting. One of the reasons I love these kinds of shows is just seeing how this stuff plays out, right? So as an example, in Survivor, any of you know anything about it, basically they all lie, they all backstab, they, it's a competitive game to win a lot of money. Now, the way the men's gameplay is characterised is solid, that solid gameplay, that's what you got to do. So if they lie to a friend to get further or something, they just go, oh, it's part of the game, almost without fail. If the women do exactly the same thing, they are referred to as manipulative or worse. Um, the definition of strength never fails to amaze me. The One of the original and best survivors, this woman called Tina Wesson, who was an American survivor 20 years ago, she, there was a very simple challenge. You had to hold your hand up for as long as you could, right? See who was the last to drop. She was in her 50s at the time. She held her hand up, I think it was for seven hours, like a massive test of endurance. There's various other examples of that throughout Survivor, and yet they still, without fail, every single season, basically say we've got to keep the strong ones in. And by that, they mean we've got to keep the young, big men in. So they define physical strength well, they define strength as physical for a start and they define that physical strength as how much you can lift or how big your muscles are rather than taking into account endurance, for example, or I don't know, being able to squeeze children out of your vagina. Just an example. Um, how the women are talked about can often be quite shocking as well. And this is not just by the men. This is by the other women as well. Just as one example, one of the older women, and of course there's intersectionality stuff going on here. I think older women cop it a lot more. She uh, made one particular gameplay and, and one of the young women said to her, why don't you go back to your knitting? Uh, one of the other guys was referring to one of the young women of colour who would challenge him because she didn't like something he said. It wasn't even particularly controversial. He said it's like having a holiday here but with someone's angry missus. Now, you know, these things, they're kind of, in some senses, they're everyday examples. They're almost benign examples on their own, but they add up. And this is the same thing in early childhood, the messages over and over and over again. Then, of course, there's the raw numbers. And, you know, I'm conscious of how serious I'm sounding about Survivor, but you probably gathered I do take it quite seriously. But who's voted out first? It is almost without fail, um, the smaller women are voted out first because of all these assumptions. And I think that might be a metaphor for some other things going on in society. But look, the primary source um, of knowledge about gender roles is the home, okay? So our watch, um, again, very credible um, research body that's done amazing research in this area and a lot of advocacy research confirms that families and in particular parents are young children's first and primary source of information and learning about gender. And that's just a fancy way of saying we learn about this stuff at home. And I think like intuitively, we know that, you know, most of our learning's done at home. Um, we can certainly unlearn it, but a lot of the stuff, even if you've got the best programs at, at school and kinder and elsewhere, uh, even if it's not reinforced at home, we're in a bit of trouble. Now, the survey found that our watch did that the majority of parents believe, and this is in Victoria, uh, in fact, in Australia, that girls and boys should be treated the same in the early years, but that parents may also inadvertently or subtly reinforce gender stereotypes and differential treatment of girls and boys. In other words, we think it should happen, but it's not always happening. And we're often reinforcing these kinds of stereotypes without even knowing. And again, like, 
I, you know, I've done gigs in this area for 20 years. I worked in the area before that. Like I'm all about it. I'm obsessed with gender and family violence and all these sort of things. I have absolutely reinforced gender stereotypes with my kids accidentally. Um, I certainly try and catch myself, but I'm not above this. And that that is another reason I think this research is another reason for us to be more conscious. Now, some practical tips, I promise. Now, these won't be for everyone. I'm just telling you how I do it. For me, there's three levels of challenge, right? There's you talking about little kids. You're not going to get in there and start talking about one woman a week's killed. Well, I certainly wouldn't. I think that's traumatising. Um, there's three levels of challenge, I reckon. One's just like, mm, that's a bit weird. Then asking questions. And another one is, and again, forgive the language, um, but is, you've got to blow shit up sometimes. Now, I'm going to explain these, so don't worry. Most of it is just that, mm, that's weird. A lot of it's questions. And then every now and then you've got to really take it up to whatever institution or whoever is um, doing something that you disagree with. I think, and again, we're coming up to Christmas, Hanukkah, end of year celebrations, Chinese New Year, whatever it is, your particular thing. If you go to every single event like that and you just constantly at people about gender roles and you're picking on every word and you're, you know, then Nelly doesn't get invited the next year. You know, like I get it. I'm not sort of suggesting you have to go in every single time and challenge everything you disagree with, um, which is why I think there's different levels of how to deal with things. So, for example, that's weird, right? This year, 2020, this is Will Smith. He appeared on his wife's chat show. He cried. Now, some of you would have missed this, but he was lampooned, right, for, you know, crying on his wife's podcast uh, or chat show or whatever it is. Uh, my eldest daughter saw something about it on TikTok. My approach with that was just to go, that's weird. Why would anyone think it's bad to cry? Okay, so rather than talking her through a room of one's own and Virginia Woolf and Judith Butler and, you know, whatever, just for me, it was enough to just kind of go, that's just really weird. Like we don't normalise teasing a man for crying. Um, another example, I was watching Ocean's Eleven with the kids, don't ask me why. We ran out of Netflix in ISO or something. All of the characters, bar one, were male. Uh, and again, rather than we have to turn this video off, we're not going to watch this movie, I can't, this is not going to pass the best old test, so I'm not into it. Just like, that's weird. Why would there only be one woman in and all those guys to prompt them to think for themselves? Related example, given it is the International Day of, for People with Disabilities, we watched The Voice this year. We loved The Voice. Um, when this kid got up and he did a great audition and he had a, obviously he sang, and it was a very strange thing because all the panellists then got up and sort of danced behind him in what I felt was a very patronising kind of way because they didn't do it for anybody else. And one of the kids went, why are they dancing with him and not anyone else? And I was like, yeah, that's weird, isn't it? So, again, to get them to think about why are they treating this boy differently, um, even though their intentions are good, why are they treating this boy differently than they're treating um, other people. The next level, forgive me while I take a little sip. Mm, that was awkward. I'm glad I can't see your faces now. My goodness. The next level is to actively question. So why is something happening? For example, you're reading The Faraway Tree, my favourite book, still love it. Absolutely obsessed with that from, um, from my own childhood. First of all, you can make fun of the names, you know, I don't know why in the modern versions they're not Fanny and Dick anymore because that's hilarious. Um, but in the faraway tree, of course, the boy, he chops the wood and he's got to look after his sisters and make sure you do this and the girls have got to wash the dishes and they cry all the time. And da Again, I love these stories, but worth when you're reading them, just going, why? Like, why does the boy have to look after the girls? He's not even the oldest one. So actually prompt the kids when they're old enough. Um, Again, you can tell how much crap TV we watch. This is, I think it's America's Got Talent, looking at that and going, okay, so the two male judges and the male host get significantly more airtime and have more authority. And the women, they have a say, but they have a very different role. To ask the kids, particularly if you've got older kids, why you think that's happening coming up to Christmas again or various other family events. We've certainly had 
I won't give you a real example, that would be rude, <laughs> but let's say, um, let's say for argument's sake, your, your mother-in-law or your auntie or your father or somebody uh, says, you know, why is that boy wearing a skirt? Or why does that girl have short hair or whatever it is? Maybe then talk to the kids about, well, why would they think that? Why would they be questioning that? Why would they be asking questions about that? Rather than telling the kid, oh, you know, they're being sexist or they're being whatever they are to actually get them to start developing critical thinking skills. And look, the final level, and sometimes you've got to blow shit up. Sometimes if you're into basketball, as I am in the NBA, you've got to throw an elbow every now and then. For example, when my youngest daughter um, wanted to get her hair, all her hair cut off, we had two different hairdressers on the same day refuse to cut her hair. They literally said to me, why would you do that to her? You know, one of them wanted to get the manager. I had to show them a picture of Winona Ryder. They didn't know who Winona Ryder was. It was a whole thing. I ended up talking to the manager and yes, I did make some complaints. Um, if someone's getting bullied, you know, I don't think, I'm not asking questions then. I'm not being kind of diplomatic and, you know, let's try and educate. Um, if someone's being bullied, you blow shit up, you get in there and you sort it out and um, you do that however you need to do it. An example, not maybe as extreme as that, well, it's not as extreme that one of my kids' schools, I just noticed it wasn't deliberate, but every week at assembly in primary school, it would be a boy leading the assembly. I happened to have some public speaking skills, so I was able to go up and have a chat to the principal, and I deemed it was worth doing that. It was worth causing a bit of a fuss and making people uncomfortable because you can't have um, that kind of... Uh, stereotype being reinforced and those roles being reinforced, sometimes you have to just make people uncomfortable. And of course, absolutely without question, if there's a minimising of violence, if there's a discussion um, about, you know, family violence incident where it's minimised or heaven forbid a death, um, these things are still reported in such um, despicable ways often, that of course requires significant challenge. But look, my main strategy, and especially when it comes to little kids, since we're talking about the early years, is just to kind of point out how bizarre it is. It's all made up stuff by somebody else. You're making fun of a boy because he likes a doll. That doesn't make any sense. How weird. You know, you do that over and over. They already think it's a bit weird because I think kids are far more accepting than adults are. Just reinforcing that I think is a really good place to start. Um, then there's conscious challenge, and this is where I come to my books, but there's a whole range of other resources. I'm only talking about my books because obviously I know them <laughs> because I wrote them. Um, my books, some girls, some boys, some brains are all con a conscious challenge to stereotypes. So some girls was the first one. And I'm just going to sort of talk you through my thinking with a, a few of the pages so you know what I was trying to do, hopefully what I've achieved. Okay, so start with an issue like, Anger in women and girls is normal, all right? So I think one of the things that we really still struggle with as a society is allowing girls and women to be angry. And we often characterise anger in girls and women really negatively. You know, I'm not bossy, I'm the boss, all of that kind of stuff. Not allowing girls to have a full suite of emotions. Um, Characterising female leaders in a much more harsh way than male leaders, for example. Um, really seeing assertiveness even as anger and yet we turn around and again I'm sorry to make this so heavy but we turn around when there are assaults for example and say well why didn't you do something why didn't you say no why didn't you set in place a boundary when all the time we're telling women and girls you know don't say no don't be angry don't cause a fuss make yourself small be compliant so very contradictory messages so one of the pages, it's actually one of my favourite pages in Some Girls. All of the pages hopefully have some fun in them and something interesting and dynamic and active. Um, it's just that simple statement, all girls get mad sometimes. Nothing wrong with getting mad, letting little girls know, and I'll get on to boys as well, letting them know it's perfectly fine to be mad. It's not okay to throw a punch. It's not okay to be mean, all of that kind of stuff. But having the emotion of anger, not only is it good, it's healthy. Um, 
another issue I wanted to address directly, and this is another page from some girls, is that men can take caring roles. Okay, we can't keep talking about gender inequity in the home and goodness knows it has increased dramatically during coronavirus. It sort of revealed some truths. We weren't as far along as we thought, um, but we can't keep talking about men not stepping up if we're still stereotyping for boys and young men that they're not caring. Okay, so very deliberately, uh, this is a page from some girls, some girls like gentle things and it's a girl sitting with her dad. All right, so very deliberately not having her sitting with a mum. Uh, just as a side note, this is the only adult in any of my kids' books. All right? I didn't want adults in there. It's meant to be about kids and for kids. But this was a direct response for any of you who followed the hideous Bill Leakes controversy a, a few years ago about um, disparaging remarks about Aboriginal fathers. This is my kind of little way of countering that, which is nowhere near enough, but it was the best that I could do to show an Aboriginal father in a, in a positive and loving light. Um, another issue I wanted to address was the idea that girls' bodies are not weak. Oh, we're still going on about this, aren't we? We still are so uncomfortable with the idea of women's and girls' bodies being strong, as you can see by the incredible backlash that Taylor Harris experienced. So this is just, again, one of the pages that I've drawn from random from some girls. Some girls like rough stuff. And I'm very proud to say, and I'm not going to be modest about it, I'm very proud to say on this day um, of celebrating people with disabilities that I absolutely consciously, deliberately make sure in all of my books to include kids with disabilities and not just to include them, but to make sure they're part of the action. Like you'll notice none of my books will have a little kid with a disability sitting in the corner being read to, you know, everyone feeling sorry for them. No, nah, they're in there. They're playing. They are doing tug of war. They're playing all sorts of other things. They're playing sport. They're amongst it. So just stating very clearly, some girls like rough stuff. Doesn't mean all girls do, um, but a lot more girls do than we give them credit for. There's so many other pages I could talk about, but I'm just conscious of the time. Um, Some Boys was my next book and it was, you know, it's basically the same thing, but it was um, aimed more at boys. There was a bit more focus on emotional intelligence because I think that's an issue that boys struggle with. Um, one of the issues I wanted to talk about is that play, you watch a bunch of little kids um, before they've been socialised, right, which is hard to get that perspective, but a lot of them will do cross-gender play. A lot of them will play with all sorts of toys before they find out either directly or indirectly that it's not okay. We gender it. We gender it for them. One of the things I find amazing, and the kinder teachers will testify to this, even in, in kinders and other places where they're trying to say, for example, offer little uh, dolls to boys, you'll sometimes get resistance from parents who, who don't want their um, sons playing with little dolls, which I find incredible when um, we're trying to teach boys to be more caring and nurturing. So very deliberately put in the um, boys book that some boys like gentle things, you know, some of them like rough things too. Some of them like pretty things. Some of them like tough things. It's not about telling them that they have to like gentle things or they're not allowed to like rough things. It's about honouring um, that some of them like different things. In fact, all of them like different things. Another issue that happens, I think, which is a bit more subtle, insidious, is this kind of unconscious programming that feminine things are bad. So any of you of my vintage will know, you know, David Beckham and Victoria Beckham, he caused such a hoo-ha. Well, he didn't cause it. Such a hoo-ha happened when they went on a date in the early years, back in the day, and he wore a skirt, by which I mean he wore this sarong that you're seeing. And I've seen him interviewed about it, and he said he's never had, through all the other stuff that's happened with his marriage and career and kids and a whole range of things, he's never had more backlash. And this is pre-social media, really, so, which is amazing. Um, than because he dared to wear a skirt. And I think the panic about that is partly homophobia, but it's partly also the idea that to feminise yourself as a man is to be less than, because feminine things are less than. So I absolutely deliberately included um, the fact that some boys like wearing skirts. And again, if they're not told not to, you will certainly see that some boys enjoy doing that. And of course, we know it's culturally specific anyway. None of this stuff's written in stone. If you're in, um, 
you know, a range of different cultures. I'm thinking Samoan cultures, for example, but there's others. Uh, men do wear, you know, sarongs, what we would identify as a skirt, even in some cultures, you know, dresses for all intents and purposes. Like it's so culturally specific to historically and different cultures. Uh, and yes, whenever I've done interviews about this book in the media, this is the first page they want to talk to. So I find it really interesting that we kind of go, it's no big deal, it's no big deal. And yet, ooh, what? There's a kid's book with a boy in a skirt. Yeah, there is, you know, get over it. Um, now, this is a big thing. It was a very big difference in this book compared to the girls' diff um, book because boys, I think, little boys are not given permission to understand and even to feel their feelings, right? Then we turn around when they start showing the consequences of not having emotional intelligence and being in touch with their feelings and we get very angry with them. In some cases, uh, and I think this is an interesting quote here, we end up creating almost stunted men. You know, we end up creating men who have not developed a fully rounded um, humanity where they have not developed their emotional intelligence along with their intellect and their, their physical development as well. And that's what we're aiming to do. So again, just there's other pages, but this is one that I pulled out. All boys get sad. Even something as simple as that, it's normal to feel sad. It's okay to feel sad. All boys get mad. You know, there's no point telling boys not to have anger. Boys have anger. All humans have anger. All boys are shy. And that is me sort of trying to show that some boys are vulnerable. You know, we all feel vulnerable at different times to honour that, to let boys know that that's normal. Um, so that's, I could talk about my third book. I'm sort of conscious of the time. I, I have an autistic child, um, which is why I wrote Some Brains, which is really celebrating neurodiversity. And again, I'd be remiss not mentioning that today on the International Day for disability, for people with disabilities. Um, but I feel like we haven't really got time to go into some brains, but I'll take some questions on it if you'd like. But look, I wanted to kind of wind up by saying, I feel like I've always been interested in these issues, but since having two little girls um, who have very different expressions of being a girl, I've got almost inside info. So my little one, the one that you can see climbing up there on her indoor gym, uh, she's often mistaken for a boy. Sometimes she, we want to correct it. Sometimes she doesn't. We sort of leave it up to her. But looking at the difference in how people speak to these kids, honestly, with, with her, it's always, oh, hello, little man. Hello, boss. Show us your muscles. You know, literally that kind of stuff. And it's not anyone being rude. They're not trying to. They're not consciously going, oh, I want to reinforce a gender stereotype. It just happens. Whereas they talk to my other daughter in the way that little girls are often spoken to. Hello, princess. Hello, sweetheart. Aren't you beautiful? Aren't you lovely? Uh, that kind of stuff. So it's this sort of self-perpetuating thing that we don't even notice. But I think in my case, when you've got two girls who are so different, it's perhaps more obvious. In summary, like you as parents um, or as educators, um, even as community members who are just around children, we have enormous power. We really do. And we have to remember that. And I feel like it's really important to remember that, especially when we get lost in the idea that we can't change it. We can change. If you go back to my beautiful grandmothers, think of how family violence was thought of then. Think even of, I mean, they couldn't have even got a bank loan. You know, you can change. That's within a couple of generations. So we can keep changing. Know what the stereotypes are because they can be so unconscious and commit to challenging them. And again, as I said, that doesn't have to be full-throated challenge every single time. That doesn't have to be jumping down people's throats when they say something wrong. But it's about knowing some different strategies for challenging. Be conscious um, about gender and how your kids are being um, raised within a gendered framework. Pick your battles and your methods. You can't fight everything at the same level every time. I think I will gift to you if you want to use it. That's weird. It's just a really effective one if it's reinforced over and over again. Asking why, getting them to think critically when they can, and when you really need to, just blowing shit up. Um, I think I'll leave it there because I really would like to leave some time for some questions. So 
yeah, let's leave it there and I'll hand back to Liz and I'll stop sharing my screen if I can work out how to do that and I'll take some questions. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks so much, Nelly. I think if everybody's screens were on, we'd be all clapping and shouting and I'll doing do thumbs that. up and you I can get a lot of... Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've got just, there's a lot of comments and I've got written down a couple of questions in case people are a little bit too shy. Okay. But um, what I think that the first um, point was that people, that there was a comment and I've just gone past it. That's not helpful. Um, really loving the three levels of responding, like that's weird, um, you know, why and then blowing shit up. And I really like that because I think, um, and, you know, we've got this comment from Lynn, I love this concept of three levels of responding and the, that's weird response will be part of my repertoire now. So thanks. I think that's really ah. um, a good one to use. And Kelly's saying she uses that's weird with her students. So that's right. um, a bit of, a bit of, um, no, please let, me, let me just speak to that a little bit. I think the reason is I find certainly when I started working in this area initially, um, I, and I was a lot younger, obviously, in my early 20s, be before I became a comedian, I worked in family violence and in mm -hmm. homelessness services and things like that. And I was so passionate, which is wonderful, but I would go straight to the challenge, straight to the, no, you're wrong. Why'd you say that? You're a terrible person. You know, no kind of subtlety about it. And of course, over time, you realise for a start, I'm not right about everything. Like... <laughs> I've made many mistakes uh, on a range of issues, um, but also you just don't change anything doing that all the time. You know, it it's just feels like attack and defence. Sometimes you do have to attack. Like I'm not saying that you don't ever attack, sometimes you do. But wherever you can, I think to kind of go, hmm. Mm. Yeah, what? and I resonated with what you're saying there because, you know, for a long time, you kind of get the, and, and coming up to Christmas, you know, at my family, I'd be like, you know, you'd call something out and people would be, oh, here she uh, goes again. Yeah, there's. You know, get off your soapbox, Liz. Or, well, you know, and you feel like that a lot in the people sector. Yeah, you do. And I think a lot of people kind of um, can resonate with that. So, yeah, that, those different levels, um, just attacking people or, you know, just going straight for it doesn't necessarily always the best option. Um, Callie's saying today I was teaching a prep class and one of the boys was dancing around like a ballerina. Another girl said he was getting makeup for Christmas. I don't know if it's true. doesn't matter if it's not, if it is or not. Anyway, a few kids were saying things like, look at him. He's so silly being a ballerina. He's being a girl, etc." My comment, my response was, that's cool. He can if he wants. They looked at me like, what? And shrugged their shoulders yeah. and changed the subject. So yeah. yeah, it's sort of even those little preppies, you know, still got that kind Absolutely. of. But where'd they learn that from? It's my first question. But I also think at least in that case, they've got another point of view being offered. So yeah. in that in that case of, kind, and I've been in that situation too, and I will even lie just, you know, just quietly and just go, oh, yeah, I've got a friend who's a ballerina. He's great. His name's Tom. And he, you know, dances for the blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, just to kind of normalise it and kind of, I'm not worried because I think what happens is sometimes adults take on the anxiety of the situation. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Do I tell them off? Do I, you know, what I, maybe just get ready with the lie, <laughs> you know, and just, oh yeah, my mate wears, yeah. wears makeup. Yeah. Helpful parenting tips. Thanks, Nelly. No, <laughs> just like, get ready I for the lie. Yeah. I think it's fine. Like, Love does it. it really matter? Just go, yeah, my, you know, I actually do have a friend wears, who wears makeup. So that one was an yeah. easy one. But just to kind of, go, oh, yeah, you know, my friend Blair, he wears nail polish. And Thank in you. that very matter of a fact way. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So you're also not shaming that little kid either, you know, yeah. like in terms of having that, that stereotype, because we're all, it, you know, products of our environments and, you know, 100%. influenced by, so it's not, not necessarily that four-year-old's body. And that kid might just think about that later and go, mm -hmm. oh, she knows a boy who wears nail polish. That's kind okay. of cool. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. You know, rather, whereas if you go, that's mean. Yeah. If you're being yeah. a bully, then they're not listening to another no. one. No, no. Um, a lot of love for the books. So um, there's some people using the books and reading them and loving uh -huh. them. So that's good. A couple of comments about, you know, kids, their boy um, used to pick up my son from what I think is family daycare, FDC. 
um, yep. wearing yellow tutu every day without fail, just another dress up. Um, you know, another one wearing Emma Wiggle outfit was told by an older man she was abusing her son by making him wear it when it was his choice. You know, that sort of terrible stereotypes coming through there. I have heard from some kinder teachers where they have, you know, generalist play set up. So they'll have the mm-hmm. play, you know, the play corner with the, what do they call it? Home corner, you know, with the um, oven and the ironing board and all those kinds of things. And then there'll be another one that's got Lego and da da da. And they're trying to do the right thing. And they're going, the kids can play with whatever they want. And I have heard early childhood educators say, parents will come in and go, don't you let my boy play in. Yeah you know, that corner or with that doll or don't you let her. I think we're a bit, ironically, we're a little bit more relaxed with girls doing, you know, cross-gender play. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, I certainly don't want to create the impression that I think the, that the kinder teachers are doing anything wrong, you know. Like it's um, yeah. usually they're offering a range of things. Don't, definitely. That would be my experience. My son's 10 now, but definitely yeah. um, that would have been my experience back then too. Yeah. Um, we've got a question from Man- Manjinda. Um, hello out there. How do you how do we challenge our own cultural conditioning around gender stereotypes? We just get a good going. one there. Yeah, we I mean, I think that's that's an ongoing process for all of us, isn't it? Because, you know, if I said that I don't have any cultural conditioning left um around gender stereotypes, I'd be lying. And I have dedicated well I'm 46 now and I've been studying in this area really since I was 17 Um, and so I think about and this is where I try and be more patient because I think I think about this every day I work in this area I've written books in this area I've done goodness knows how many gigs in this area and I still make these mistakes which is why I try and be patient with others I think if you are conscious about it, the more conscious you can be, it's no different to racism. It's no different to homophobia or any other form of exclusion, um, disability stereotypes, a whole range of things. Be conscious uh, about your conditioning. If you see it, you can change it. If you know you're uncomfortable with the idea of a man crying, for example, instead of getting angry, how about you sit with it and go, where did that come from? Where did I learn that from? Does that make sense? Mm. Is it actually okay for men to cry? I think once you actually own it and you start to, mm. of course it's okay for men to cry, mm. but you might have an emotional reaction where you go, oh, don't like that. Yeah. Look at how yeah. people react when um, Roger Federer cries. Mm. Bless him. Every year at the tennis. I adore <laughs> Roger Federer. And I, one of the reasons I do is because of that, to see a man in a public forum cry, I think is very powerful. Yeah. But yes, there's no, I'm, I'm not suggesting for a second there's perfection. There's only mm-hmm. knowledge and deliberate intent. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, question from Lynn. Any tips for getting the we gender play across to adults who are convinced innate differences explain why children choose different toys? So maybe that, yeah. Well, I mean, my first, it depends who you're dealing with because anyone who does research in this area will tell you there's outliers on both ends that you'll never convince, all right? There'll be a group of people who will always say, and these are not always men, they can be women as well, there'll be a group of people who go, no, boys are born this way, that's how they are, um, this is how they play, stop with all this feminist bullshit, uh, you know, often quite aggressive, ironically, in how it's like, you are not going to change that person. And I think one thing I've learned over the years is to try and go, you're wasting your time, actually, on that person. It's like trying to convince someone who's so entrenched in their views. That's not most people, though. Most people are what they call in the research terms, the movable centre. So mm. most people might be closer toward that or to the other extreme and they can you can talk to them about it and you can I mean I would say on just a basic level we don't know um, what boys and girls would be like without socialization because there are none Mm. that haven't Mm. been socialized I mean look at what presents do you get why do we have gender reveal parties (laughs) you know what good question why indeed why indeed why do we announce to the world I'm having a girl or I'm having a boy 
um, because, and this is the answer you'll get from parents, and this is before this child's even born, because we need to know what clothes to get them. Yeah. Or yeah. how to decorate their room. Yeah. What does that mean? Why? Yeah. What difference yeah. would it make to a baby what <laughs> colour their room was painted? And that's not about attacking. That's about just questioning. We've got a whole heap of assumptions before that child's even born let alone once they come out, how they're talked to, how they're played with, um, what roles we prescribe for them. Yeah. And there was a comment earlier around people saying, you know, how they treat a babe, a newborn when they see a newborn. Oh, is it a girl right. or a boy? Okay. Oh, big, strong fella, you know, yep. and then gorgeous, pretty, cute, you know, exactly and what you know you're what? saying. I'm going to own this, Liz. I do that still. Yeah, I, I mean, I do too. Myself. Yeah. I will catch myself doing it, but I absolutely, if I've got a little baby girl, you're so gorgeous, you're mm. so pretty. And, you know, I get that little squeaky voice on. <laughs> that my yeah. daughter, if you get a squeaky voice, you know, yeah. and I have to catch myself. Like yeah. I'm also part of this culture. Yeah. Um, but to just reinforce that other thing, I think if you're sitting at Christmas lunch, you know, or whatever celebration you do, and you've got, in my case, it would be like that entrenched uncle, you know, or that entrenched auntie or whoever that is baiting, that he just wants to fight, I just say, walk away from that. What is the point? You're yeah. giving up your celebration. You're not going to change them. They actually want to argue their way into a more entrenched position. Mm -hmm. You've got to make a judgment. Do they actually want to have a conversation? If they don't, I've learned this the hard way. Let it go. Yeah, 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 walk away. Um, Jeannie's asking, how should we address our children, say to the round them up in the playground instead of saying, hey, boys, let's go? How, what, what would you suggest there? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I mean, one of the things that I have had to learn as a speaker, so obviously I would, I started comedy in 2002. So then I started doing lots of, you know, events and emceeing things. And you would always say, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I've learned over the years, and this is probably that maybe the last five or six years, um, because of progress that's been made in this area to go, welcome everyone, you know, even on that sort of simple, and it took me a while, I kept going, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, then I go, hang on, not everyone identifies with ladies and gentlemen, um, or some people find ladies offensive. I don't personally, but there's no need for me to offend. So I may as well just go, hi, everyone. Everyone, How you yeah. Going? Hi, yeah. everyone. Um, so I guess in that case, in the in the, in the the schoolyard or the kinder yard, you just go, come on, everyone, in we go. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, different people will uh, ascribe different meanings to things. I sort of, I noticed on Survivor, I don't know if anyone thought it was ridiculous that I gave the Survivor example is, um, but they will often do, oh, the girls, even though they'll be women who are, you know, 55. Um, I wouldn't go to blow shit up for that, but I'd probably go to, that's weird, <laughs> you know, referring to a 55-year-old woman as a girl mm. or even yeah. a 25-year-old woman as a girl. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's not, I guess there's levels. There's levels, aren't there? Yeah. It's not the most offensive thing I've heard in my life, put it that way. Yeah. And Kelly's here saying, I try to say, hey, grade three, four, or hey, scientists, yeah. or hey, sports stars, depending on the subject. So that's another good one for um, the one my I friends, guess, teachers which, or the educators. Yeah. One of my friends, which I love, she says, hey, legends, let's yeah. go. You yeah. know, so like trying to pick, a, I love that that's so positive as well, um, but it's just not gendered in any way. Can I just say, though, I think don't, I mean, I think that's really good if you can do that and give it, it's a probably a relatively easy thing to do, but also don't beat yourself up if you kind of go, oh, hey, girls, like that's not what's going to make or break this whole scenario, you know, if you go, yeah. oh, hey, boys, what? try and be conscious of it, but there's far more important things to be doing, especially when they do that stuff that you mentioned before, Liz, oh, there's a boy doing ballet. Oh, what a girl. Okay, that needs to That's the important time, yeah. That's important. Yeah. Yeah, what do you mean by that? What's it mean? What do you mean that's a girl? Is yeah. being a girl bad? Yeah. Don't, aren't yeah. there boy ballerinas? You know, or whatever questions you can ask at that point. That's the important stuff, I think. We've got um, a couple of really just interesting comments. So I can't read all the comments out given the time, but um, I just like this one. Gender begins before birth even. First question is often, how are you? Are you having a boy or a girl? 
Yeah. And a, a further comment, a father had challenged their boy playing in role play with dolls and prams when the educator explained the child was modelling how his father had cared for him when he was little. The father then got his son a role play pram and doll for Christmas. You know, it's oh, sometimes it is that conversation, isn't it? Where Absolutely. You know, we've kind of grown up with this, you know, boys play with trucks, girls play with yep. dolls and you come in to have your own children and you think, oh, my God, I'm like stereotyping them like yep. mad. Sometimes you don't know that. So, yes. yeah, I mean, I think that was a great example there. Thank you. That's a really good that. example because also the re the 20 year old me would have gone to that dad, well, don't be so sexist. Exactly. He straight can play whatever the... he wants, straight to DEFCON 4, straight to you're wrong, you know, rather than kind of going, oh, well, most people are in the movable center. Just explain very calmly and clearly. Oh yeah, isn't it great? Like you're obviously a really caring dad and he's modeling what you did. What you've done. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. That's a really great one. Um yeah, I, I suppose there was another question around. Oh, here we go. Actually, so someone's, someone's I just said, saying, but it's just okay. side note on that. I went too far the other way with my older daughter. I didn't want her to have Barbies. Yeah. And then I realised, you know, Barbies, they're like bloody cockroaches. It's just like you can't keep them out of the house. Like someone kept, you yeah. should get one for a birthday and then grandma would buy one and, you know, then. And so I ended up just saying to her, all right, you're going to have Barbies, but they've got to have a job, right? So yeah. you could have like a Barbie who's an engineer and a Barbie. Beck, test the Barbie, yeah. Beck, they'll test the Barbie. Yeah, yeah. But you did quite rightly point out, mum, it's my present. Yeah. You know? So like you can go, yeah, yeah. Like mallowed. Um, I guess that, that another question was sort of what suggestions did you have for parents or carers wanting a, to approach gender equity with their school or their kinder or their childcare or whatever? Like, did you have any kind of simple suggestions that I think these days people, th those sorts of centres are really a bit more on board than maybe even, you know, three or four or five years ago. So yes. there's a lot of resources out there. I guess if people kind of want to direct their school or whatever to something, yeah. Have you got any ideas? Um, look, I reckon there's there's so many resources now. I mean, probably your first stop would be uh, either would be to go to Our Watch, and they've got some uh, great resources. You, obviously, your local council, including you, and you know yeah. all the other councils involved, have all got gender equity officers or a variation on that, um, and they might be able to talk to your school. You know, so if you don't have the confidence or you don't want to, again, this is so gendered, but I'm just going to be honest, if you don't want to cause a fuss, mm. um, then maybe you could talk to your gender equity council uh, counsellor at your council mm. or at your council and kind of go, hey, I'm a little bit mm, about what this school's doing. Could you talk to them? Or yeah, can you offer definitely. some resources and maybe they can do some training. For me, it sort of depended. Like I didn't want to be, you know, you don't want to be that, mum who's going up and karening everyone <laughs> again sexist anyway yeah um you know going up and and like being critical about everything but where I thought it was really important like for example the fact that the boys were doing assembly um and again I knew it wasn't deliberate it wasn't deliberate but it was reinforcing something that I didn't like mm. that's worth having conversation yeah you know? yeah yeah that's great um, did you have any suggestions about modelling gender equity at home with our kids? Oh. I mean, you've already given us loads of suggestions, but. No, well, this one, this one's a really hard one for me because I won't lie about it. If I'm completely honest, we certainly don't have gender equity in our house. You know, my, um, it's certainly during lockdown, like almost every other household, despite the fact that my partner and I, he's gender studies trained, so am I. You know, we've got plenty of resources. We're both in this area. There is absolutely no doubt that um, the majority of the caring and, you know, household responsibilities go to me. There's a range of reasons for that that I could explain to you all and you could probably all relate to. Um, it's an ongoing challenge. The reason I'm honest about that is because I don't think it's fair to put that back, usually back on women, and I've seen this happen, where it's almost like, well, you've failed, you know, to achieve equality in your household. And you go, hang on, everything's set up for me to fail. Mm. <laughs> everything is set up. Again, if you take an example, I remember with my own partner, I'm probably revealing too much, but I remember going, 
what? Like I'm running around buying Christmas presents, you know, for your family, for my family, for doing the yeah. whole distress. I've got a new baby. No, no, no. You know, I've got a kid with disability. And I remember he said to me, well, just don't buy them. And I'm like, you don't know the consequence yeah. is different. You know, like it is different, even if it's not my mother or my sister-in-law or whatever it is, if there's no Christmas presents, it is me who will be judged. Oh, yeah. 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 And we can all give examples and you can talk about work structures and that's just one example among an ocean of many. The consequences are gendered and they're different. So I won't pretend that we model equality in the house. We just try our best. We try our best. And I think that's a good message. I mean, everyone, you know, the word journey, but everyone's on their own journey of understanding yep. and knowing what gender inequality is, what the yep. drivers of violence against women are and how to respond to that. So I think, you you know, your advice earlier, don't be too harsh on yourself. If you say, yep. you know, if, if you, you know, if, if, if that's what's happening at the moment for you and your family. And, you know, I think that... Um, yeah, we've got to be kind and you've got to, everyone's on their own way of learning. And if you're thinking about it going, oh, why am I, like what you said earlier, questioning, why am I uncomfortable with Roger Federer crying? Or is it yeah. Federer? I don't know. Crying yeah. on the, on the yeah, tennis yeah. TV. Like, why am I uncomfortable with that? What's yes. that about? And think about that. You're yes. becoming aware of it. So I, I think that's really good starting point for people. Even don't, you don't have to do all the feminist reading. You don't have to be, you know, yeah. start to think, what am I, what's going on there for me? And also honour your personality. You know, I think that there's, you know, we can't, there's not one strategy that suits everybody. Like I'll give you a quick example. We were in Bali a few years ago and I was walking along with uh, my oldest daughter and one of her friends. And one of the shopkeepers yells out, oh, hey, sexy mama, you know, and, you know, saying all of this sort of stuff. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm not particularly confrontational, but I remember thinking I've got two 12-year-old girls with me I literally remember in that split second thinking, I can't just let this yeah. go. And I walked over to him and I said, that's very rude. You know, mm. and that's really, offended. don't speak to me like that. And honestly, this sounds like I'm so up myself, but they looked at me like I was a superhero and I was so proud of myself and I was so glad that I had modelled to them. Yeah. But I will also say that not everyone can do that. Mm. You know, not everyone has that kind of personality. Not everyone has the the confidence, the training, the whatever it is. Um, so you will find your way and your situations. You know, in that case, if you couldn't bring that direct challenge, for example, maybe you'd talk to those girls after. Exactly. Yeah, that that's, a, that's a really great point because it, it is does take a certain amount of courage and confidence and maybe privilege as well in terms of being like able to awesome. kind of call that out in the, in public like that. So not Speaking everyone can do that. Do you mm. imagine for one second um, that the, you know, I don't know, the Balinese nanny, mm. you know, with the kids down the road could speak to, back to that man like that? Mm. No. So, of course, there's privilege, which is why I'm not prescriptive about it. It's not like I think you mm. or you have to do this. If you don't call it out, you know, you've failed. No. Make an assessment. Am I safe for a start? Yeah. Can I do this? Um, what do I want to do? And mm -hmm. then do it if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Great. That's that's good. Um, we've probably got time for this last one. Um, and then Jody will, uh, Bianca will wrap us up. So, um, Talia, other than your great books, do you have any other favourites for children or adults? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, there's so many. Um, Geez, I should have thought about that one, shouldn't I? I just kind of, if you get onto, um, there's lists, you know, again, a lot of councils will have lists recommending various books that either challenge gender stereotypes or um, various other kinds of stereotypes. My current favourite one is, you know, Briggs, the rapper. Yeah. Um, now, that's not a gender uh, book. But um, those kinds of books that have got some kind of social challenge in them. Yeah. One, th well, the reason I love that and what I tried to do in my books, though, is that they are still fun. Mm. One of the things I find with some issues based kids' books is that they're so boring. <laughs> it's like, you know, there's no joy in them. Yeah. Uh, there's got to be joy in this as well. Like, I don't want kids thinking, 
that you know to think critically about things is to to be negative you know they're very different things um so try and find ones when you're looking in the bookshop try and find ones that also like bring a smile to your face mm. and they're not just ones that you as an adult go oh yes that's an important message yeah. <laughs> you know it's got to cut through that's good advice and I know um there's a few comments in the chat as well to links to different things like level playground and all of the rest of it and like you said the libraries particularly for the northern region Yarra Plenty regional libraries have got book lists up at the moment um that kind of thing so oh ask your librarian I oh, mean yeah. absolutely yeah. if you go in and say to your librarian what's some good fun kids books that have got, um, you know, good, decent diversity in it. And I would add into that, as I spoke about before, kids with disabilities as well, different, you know, even different body shapes, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Like, look, seek those out. Librarians will know. They yeah. will absolutely know. Definitely. Jill's recommended, I have Girls Don't Fart, says my nine-year-old That sounds boy. great. I don't know that book, but I'm going to look <laughs> that up now. Because again, even that, you know, the, the picture I showed of my daughter's um, book, the reason I show that is because I think even now, you know, you bring that up at Christmas lunch. If a little boy wrote that book, it'd be, oh, isn't he? That's so funny. You might get a little bit, oh, come on, don't be naughty. But it would be kind of charming and funny. A little girl brings that up over Christmas lunch it's gross oh no don't do that Disgusting. Mm. you know so active challenge for that kind of stuff I think is really important yeah well I'm gonna say I'm gonna um hand back over to Bianca um but just before I do yes we are recording and yes we will email the link to everybody but I'll hand back over to you Bianca thanks Nelly beautiful um, thank you all. And that has actually provided us with the perfect segue. So thank you very Nelly, much, Nelly, for doing my job for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, because Banyul, Millenbeck uh, and Whittlesey Councils have also been doing a gender equity reading challenge or the Respect is Reading Challenge. And we're sort of throwing it out there that Yarra Plenty Library have plenty of books, plenty of recommendations um, for you know books that really do challenge those gender stereotypes for both boys and girls so we would really encourage people to have a look on the social media for city of Whittlesea, city of Banyul and Nillambic Shire councils um, to find a book and get involved with this 16 days of activism against gender-based violence reading challenge we just want you to read a book that you know promotes gender equality and respect and libraries will have those suggestions and I think you know everyone could go out and have a look at Nellie's books now too um, but we've also kind of tried to gamify it and make it a competition to really make it a conversation about it so we're sort of throwing it out there take a photo if you don't want to show your face in the photo, um, you can take just a picture of the book and then email it into us or use the social media to tell us what you really took away from that message or it doesn't have to show um, great gender sort of stereotype breaking. It's more if you've been aware now that actually there's sort of stuff wrong with this book and, and what those reflections are. So we'd really love to hear that um, and We'll email out because each council has a different way of sort of entering the competition. There's prizes to win. Each have variation on theme about supporting local businesses as well. Um, and always local bookshops, always important. But we really do want to thank Nellie so much for so generously sharing your knowledge and your time um, with great humour and something that we can really take home and take on the bank and also take to the bank and really, you know, get something out of, but also really looking at how we need to support our, our young boys better as well and give them permission to sort of heave ho some of those really outdated ideas that are quite unfair. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much, Nelly. And um, great to see you thank all. You. Have a great evening. And thank Bianca, you. Can I just add one, uh, one tiny thing? Thank you very much. That's very, very kind and very sweet. Um, I just wanted to add in terms of other books, like I mentioned, The Faraway Tree, because I think sometimes in this space we hear like your kids should only be reading. I mean, I love The Paper Bag Princess, for example, and obviously I love my books and there's other books and other 
but I think you can read anything mm. um, as long as you've got critical engagement with it. Yeah. So by, you know, talk about Moonface, talk about Silky, you know, talk about all of the characters in the faraway tree, talk about the kids. As long as there's an engagement with it, nothing's banned. Absolutely. You know, we're not, we're not burning any books. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the funny thing is, I read the other day that Victorian authors did better, as in the Victorian era, not state, did better at challenging some of those gender stereotypes than what we do now. So, you know, there is also some great stuff in, in classics as well. So Anchor, I think look at little babies in Victorian era. They had boys had dresses on. Absolutely. And I think someone actually mentioned the yeah. smocking, the smocked gowns yeah. in the comments, you know. So yeah. I think, yep, we can look to the future and look to the past for guidance. But I think um, as long as we're open, um, yep. we all will make mistakes. But as long as we're open to it, that's the only way to sort of move forward. So Have a try. Just yep. give it a crack. Yep. Absolutely. Cry with Roger Federer with pride. Oh, yeah. You're going to watch our Fed at the Australian Open. Yep. You think of me. Oh, that's totally. <laughs> Totally. It will be the first time that I've watched the tennis, <laughs> but I will be doing it with pride, knowing that we're celebrating men, strong men, amazing men, being able it. to be emotional in public. Yeah. yeah. And say, I love my family. Yeah. Oh, what a revelation. I know. Yeah. I know. And we know that, you know, many of us, our dads would say that potentially. So yeah. why is it a shock? Or yeah. there's a man in our life who might say that. Yeah. So, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Thanks for having me, everyone, and have a great night. Great. Thank you all. Cheers. Thanks.